Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world. I'm Teniola Oyitayo. On the program this week, UK prepares for Queen Elizabeth II's funeral. Mourners pay last respects as she lies in state. Plus, Americans remember victims of 9-11 21 years on. Thousands of people across the UK are paying their last respects to Queen Elizabeth II this week as she lies in state ahead of her funeral on Monday. Many endured pouring rain overnight to join the long wait to file past the UK's longest reigning monarch's coffin at Westminster Hall. Meanwhile, it's been a busy week for new King Charles III as he embarked on a tour of the nation as well as other royal duties. The coffin of the late Queen Elizabeth was taken along the Royal Mile and the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, in a silent and solemn procession, watched by thousands of people lining the streets to pay their respects to Britain's longest-serving monarch. Along with his brothers and sister, the new King Charles III walked behind the hearse as their mother's coffin was taken to St Gilles' Cathedral in Edinburgh for a service and 24-hour vigil. On Tuesday, the coffin was then flown to London to begin a period of lying in state until early September 19, the day of Elizabeth II's state funeral. As in Edinburgh, many thousands of ordinary people are allowed to process past and pay their respects to their late Queen at Westminster Hall. And it was at Westminster, the home of Britain's Parliament, where King Charles began his day of royal duties on Monday. Meeting and speaking about his mother's lifetime dedication to democracy, promising to follow the example set by her. My lords and members of the House of Commons, we gather today in remembrance of the remarkable span of the Queen's dedicated service to her nations and peoples. While very young, Her Late Majesty pledged herself to serve her country and her people and to maintain the precious principles of constitutional government which lie at the heart of our nation. This vow she kept with unsurpassed devotion. She set an example of selfless duty which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow. Members of Parliament then sang God Save the King before the monarch departed for Edinburgh and a tour of the UK. The 73-year-old automatically became King of the United Kingdom and 14 other realms including Australia, Canada, Jamaica, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea following the death of Queen Elizabeth on Thursday at the age of 96. Although King Charles III automatically became king following the death of his mother, an historic meeting at St. James's Palace formally confirmed his role. The proclamation event featured military in full ceremonial dress, a burglar and a 21-gun salute. Three cheers for His Majesty the King! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! 
The accession and proclamation ceremony of King Charles III last held 70 years ago for his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. It took place at St. James's Palace in London. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. King Charles's son and heir, William, newly named Prince of Wales, the Queen Consort Camilla, and an array of British lawmakers from the past and present were in attendance. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We therefore do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to whom we do acknowledge all faith and obedience with humble affection, beseeching God, by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. God save the king. God save the king. Gun salutes were then fired across the country in honour of the new monarch. Amid all the pomp and ceremony, addressing the accession council, the king vowed to serve the nation with loyalty, respect and love, and delivered an emotional tribute to his late mother. My mother's reign was unequalled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty, which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. And in Parliament, the Prime Minister and British lawmakers lined up to swear oaths of allegiance to the new King Charles. Britain has declared a period of mourning until the state funeral for the Queen on Monday, September 19th. The day has been declared a public holiday. The death of Queen Elizabeth II has drawn condolences from across the globe. Among those who paid tribute were Irish politicians who praised the Queen's efforts to repair strained ties between Ireland and Britain. But for many Irish, the occasion of the Queen's death and her legacy brings mixed emotions. Northern Irish loyalists lay flowers by a huge mural of a young Queen Elizabeth in a fiercely British corner of West Belfast, looking back at what they saw as a glorious past. Really, really sad. Although you're always expecting her, she's 96. You just never thought that would ever happen. It's so strange, it's surreal. A few hundred metres away, many Irish nationalists react to the Queen's death with indifference or polite sympathy. Loyalists who want to keep the region on the British rule remain among the royal family's most devoted subjects. Sinn Féin, the former political wing of the Irish Republican Army, horrified many loyalists in May by securing 
the largest number of seats in the regional parliament for the first time. Charles will understand continuity. He will understand, and he's been preparing for an awful long time to become the king. I think he will understand that he needs to carry on with the vein that uh, his mother um, brought the country. And, and, and one of the most interesting things was uh, Queen Elizabeth was up to date pretty much in everything. You know, if you, if you look at it, she understand what was happening, the contemporary changes to the world, and she moved with them. Uh, and I think Charles has the ability to do that as well. A potent symbol of the Union, the Queen in her later years became a major force for reconciliation with its Irish nationalist foes. Her state visit to Ireland in 2011 was the first biomonarch in almost a century of independence. The Unionists and Loyalists, the Queen was the, the symbol of, of the United Kingdom and their Britishness and they genuinely felt that the, it was the Queen that gave them their Britishness and they would revere the Queen rather than any British government because they felt they had been repeatedly betrayed by British governments but the Queen was the symbol of stability and Britishness. While some Irish nationalists in bars reportedly cheered the news of the Queen's death and some fireworks were heard in Belfast, the reaction across nationalist areas was largely muted. Sinn Féin called on supporters to be respectful and said they were looking forward to working with King Charles. Meanwhile, there are also mixed feelings in Kenya about the late Queen Elizabeth and her country's colonial legacy. Britain once ruled more than half of Africa. Many have fond memories of its longest serving monarch, who smiled and waved at crowds in 20 countries across the continent during her 70 year reign. But others remember colonial times, like the brutal 1950s crushing of Kenya's Mau Mau Rebellion as the sunset on Britain's empire. 98-year-old Kenyan Gituwaka Hengeri was 17 when he joined the rebellion against British rule. He says he mourns Elizabeth as a human being but won't forget being detained in a camp by British forces, bitten and denied food. Their empire has gone down and down and down because they did in the past do many bad things to the people of the world. But we are mourning Queen, because Queen is a person, a human being. According to Kahengeri, although he is forgiven, he cannot forget. Forgiving is in the Bible. I am a Christian. I believe in that. But, I am not a believer of forgetting. I will not forget, I personally will not forget that I was incarcerated for seven years. I cannot forget I was put together with my father. I cannot forget I left my children for seven years without food, without education, that I will never forget. The Queen was on a visit to Kenya aged 25 with her husband Philip when she learned of the death of her father King George VI and her ascension to the throne in 1952. She was to return many times to Africa as Queen. Many Africans are not so enthusiastic about celebrating the life of a monarch whose country has a checkered history in Africa. An example is Kenya cartoonist Patrick Gathara, who is encouraging people not to forget Britain's colonial past. There's a tendency by some to sort of say, well, the past is the past, just ignore it. It's a nice old lady who has passed. Um, but I'm also encouraged by the fact that there's quite, especially online, quite a vocal uh, uh, a number of people who are, who are refusing to be taken in uh, by this, who are insisting that no, the history has to be told as it is, we've got to remember it um, as it is. And especially now, when all these tributes are flowing, when all the 
um, um, when the fundamentals of that history are being laid down, that we don't accept to be erased any longer, that our stories have to be included in there, the good along with the bad. King Charles's ascension to the throne has also stirred renewed calls from politicians and activists in former colonies in the Caribbean to remove the monarch as their head of state and for Britain to pay reparations for slavery. And when Foreign Dispatches returns in just a moment, Americans remember victims of 9-11 21 years on. Please stay with us. You're still watching Foreign Dispatches on Channel's television. Americans this week honored victims of the 9-11 attacks, 21 years since the horrific incident that shocked the entire world. In a speech commemorating the day, President Joe Biden recalled American unity after the attacks that killed nearly 3,000 people. It's 8.46. The moment when the first of two planes hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains. The Bell of Hope, as it is called, has rung on every anniversary since 2002, when it was presented to New York City by London to honor the nearly 3,000 people who died in the attacks. Oh, say can you see? Over at the Pentagon, the U.S. flag was unfurled as a police officer sang the national anthem in pouring rain, and bagpipes later played Amazing Grace. Later in the morning, at a solemn commemoration at the Pentagon, President Joe Biden invoked the memory of America's united response to the attacks and vowed to never give up in the face of terrorist threats. I hope we'll remember that in the midst of these dark days, we dug deep, we cared for each other, and we came together. You know, we regained the light by reaching out to one another and finding something all too rare, a true sense of national unity. To me, that's the greatest lesson of September 11. This year's anniversary comes a year after President Biden ended the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan, launched two decades ago, to root out the Al-Qaeda militant group that carried out the 9-11 attacks after plotting them from Afghanistan. <laughs> U.S. First Lady Jill Biden was in Shantsville, Pennsylvania field, where the hijacked Flight 93 crashed, preventing the terrorists from hitting the capital, their intended target. She re-echoed the president's message of a united America after the attacks. 9-11 touched us all. It changed us all. But it reminds us that with courage and kindness, we can be a light in that darkness. It showed us that we are all connected to one another. And for relatives of the victims, 9-11-2001 remains fresh in their memories. It's a sad day. You know, we all know we're exactly where we were when, uh, you know, we saw the second plane more often than not hit the building and going, you know, what the heck's going on here now? There's a buildup, like, you know, over the summer, you know, a little more anxiety every day. And um, to this point, it's just always, you know, an anxious day. And... And after the day's over, when I go home, then you're just like physically exhausted, like you ran a marathon. And, um, but yeah, no, never, never has changed. And while politicians are not allowed to speak on the memorial grounds, many have lamented U.S. extremism and increased calls for national unity that emerged from the ruins of 9-11. Over in Pakistan, with over one-third of the country affected by flooding, millions of people are in need of food, shelter and medical care. Life is difficult at camps in the region where hundreds are living in cramped conditions. Pakistanis sheltering at this relief camp after historic flooding say there's little relief to be found at night. There are too many mosquitoes and only a few nets in sight. Electricity is also in short supply in the hardest-hit Sindh province. 
We spend each night with great difficulty. Every night is like a doomsday for us. The mosquitoes are biting and the children cannot sleep due to them. The children are falling sick due to mosquito bites and the hospitals here are not able to treat every disease from mosquito bites. Record monsoon rains have affected 33 million people and killed about 1,400. Water submerged nearly a third of the country, with Sindh receiving 466% more rain than average. Those staying in Camp Say children are struggling to cope. The crisis has also upended daily life for pregnant women. The UN Population Fund estimates 40,000 pregnant women are expected to deliver babies in September alone. This is 27-year-old Rubina Mala. She had to make a perilous three-hour boat ride through flood water to give birth to her son, Mohammed. Water had inundated our house at the banks of Mancha, where we lived. I was worried that night that how would we get to the hospital? So my husband brought a boat and I traveled to reach the hospital where my delivery took place. Blocked roads, damaged buildings and collapsed bridges have severely hampered access to emergency medical support. Medics are particularly concerned about women who cannot access medical care in time, who have complications requiring delivery via cesarean sections, or those who develop postpartum hemorrhaging, both of which can be deadly or result in disability without access to specialized health care. Both the government and the UN Secretary-General have pointed the finger for the crisis at climate change. On a visit to the region over the weekend, Antonio Guterres said he had never seen climate carnage on this scale. I've seen many humanitarian disasters in the world, but I have never seen climate carnage on this scale. I have simply no words to describe what I've seen today. A flooded area that is three times the total area of my own country, Portugal. The needs are enormous. And I urge massive and urgent financial support for Pakistan. And this is not just a question of solidarity or generosity. It is a question of justice. Pakistan is paying the price of something that was created by others. UN agencies have begun work to assess the country's reconstruction needs, with the UN chief calling for global financial help. So far, the damage is estimated to be in tens of billions. And finally, on the program, on a lighter note, let's meet a 27-year-old South African who's the first female black conductor who is making waves in the local music scene. Take a look. South Africa's first black female conductor, Ofensi Pitsi, who founded her musical collective Anchored Sound at the age of 27, pushes the boundaries of a traditional orchestra in hopes of creating a Coachella-level experience. With the help of 20 choir members and 19 musicians, Pitsi is looking for a new sound by mixing jazz, pop, electro house and classical styles. With no experience as a musical conductor, that did not deter Pitsy from forging ahead with her dream. I had like a 19-piece ensemble, and then after the 19-piece ensemble, I was like, shucks, who's going to conduct this? So then that sort of like prompted me to learn how to conduct. So I was just bothering a lot of conductors on Facebook and Instagram, seeking someone who could really like take me under their wing and all that, and then that's when Corbin Gruten. Speaking on why she created the orchestra, whose members mainly come from Johannesburg, disadvantaged communities, Pitsa said it was all about representation. I never saw you know, an orchestra that looked like me, and I consume a lot of orchestral music, so you're from your Berlin Philharmonics, all of these other things, right? But then the issue is that I've never seen something that looks like me. Ah. 
Pizze says she hopes to take the orchestra to new heights and an international standard. And this is where we say goodbye till next time. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelstv.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Teniola Uyetayo. Bye for now.